one of the most dramatic scenes of the Civil War at sea would be here off of Newport News Point on March 8, 1862, when at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the CSS Virginia, also called the Merrimack, will ram the USS Sloop of War, the Cumberland. Now, this was a traumatic event because uh, the Federals, especially on the Cumberland, they were anchored facing broadside towards the Virginia. And the Virginia came, as one person said, like a huge crocodile, half submerged crocodile intent on evil. Well, you know, they couldn't see the ram, but the ram struck, creating a hole large enough for a horse and cart to ride through. That, that ram was 1,500 pounds. It struck the uh, ship, and um, uh, as a result of that, um, you know, everyone, when the Virginia on the shore, there are 25,000 people watching from the shore, right, approximately, and they watch, and one officer over on Ragged Island, which is in Isla White County, across the river from Newport News, uh, Brigadier General Raleigh Colston said he watched the Virginia approach the Cumberland and then was all immersed in smoke. We did not know what was happening. And then I saw the Cumberland's mass sway back and forth, and I knew that we had won the day. Well, you know, of course, the ramming into the Cumberland um, was um, perhaps a great shock, but people studying naval history would know that rams were a long-standing uh, weapon. In fact, it was the key naval weapon in fighting battles like, uh, oh, this is original type of ram, as I can say. This is the Olympus. This is a reconstructed ram that you can go see in Greece. Um, they uh, are um, around a, uh, um, you know, 100 feet in length, and they are uh, actually um, very quick in turning. Notice the three tiers of oars, and so, and not being seen beneath that uh, uh, bow is the ram. Oftentimes, you would see in pictures a ram itself, and so it's a very um, formidable weapon, and uh, so this is the only original ram from ancient history that we have found. Uh, this is the athlete ram. Uh, this is actually found off the coast of Israel. Um, so possibility of being Phoenician, so forth. Uh, I think um, it is a, a way to understand. Now notice, uh, that ram is resupported, and it's got cut waters and it's made of brass using sand casting. So this was a serious weapon. Trimarines went into action basically with a ram, 170 oarsmen, right? That gave them that propulsion, propulsion that could reach up to eight to 10 knots, depending on how much you whip the slaves. Remember uh, Ben-Hur, uh, that, that's, the ramming speed business. And so you had to be able to ram and back out of your target as quickly as you could. Uh, because otherwise, like what almost happened to the CSS Virginia, um, it could be taken down uh, by the weight of the enemy's vessel. So on board a trimarine would be uh, four archers and uh, 10 spearmen. Uh, that is to harangue the uh, people on deck, especially when you ram. Now, rams all of a sudden became also a boarding device. <clears throat> the Romans formalized it <coughs> by creating what is called a corvus. And the corvus was a platform that when they rammed someone to hold them together, 
they dropped the Corvus and they'd run on board the ship and usually winning the action. So, this is a um, really major change or major tool of ancient warfare. And then by about 700 AD, it is comes out of use. Uh, um, you know, we uh, are having other battlefield techniques. We develop four castles and so forth. Uh, the Romans introduced burning uh, uh, flame arrows. And, you know, it, it it's more of a broadside and boarding technique. The battle that has always fascinated me, now this is the Battle of Sol Salamis, and, and you can see uh, the Persian, Prussians, uh, Persians have a larger fleet, but because of the narrow waters, they'll be able to focus their attack on one section of the Persian fleet, and you have to realize when you have these ships coming at you and ramming, this is a tremendous shock that happens on the battlefield. Uh, here's another. Now, galleys uh, go, trimarines go to galleys. And you can see this is really uh, similar to the trimarine uh, other than having just one bank of oars two lantern sails, and this is because it's for warfare in the Mediterranean. This is not a ship I want to take out to sea necessarily, or outside the Mediterranean, let's put it that way. Um, now, this is uh, the uh, Galas, Galilas, and, and this is a very important ship uh, because it's going to have cannon, okay? And cannon actually right, right here is the section of the ship um, that actually was almost like a turret. Uh, these ships carried 40 cannon on board. And so, you know, beforehand, we're sending what? Arrows and trying to board a ship. Cannon, now in the forward um, part of the ship, is actually where they had swivel guns to fire at the personnel on an enemy ship. The, the cannon are for firing at distance, so you're damaging the ship as they're coming towards you. Those cannon, of course, can um, destroy ships before they approach their victim. Now, um, the major change in warfare, in my opinion, uh, from uh, the galleys to future age of sail, is the Battle of Lepanto, which is uh, 7 October 1571. Okay, and so actually, typically, some people still use ramming techniques. Primarily, they would have a beak, and what they did is to ram into their enemy uh, not to sink the ship, but to hold the ships together so that they then could overwhelm the enemy. Especially, you know, you have to realize the Christian fleet uh, was pretty well equal to the Ottoman Turk fleet at this battle. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, there's a lot of praying going on. Um, and uh, this is the commander of the uh, Christian fleet, a uh, man known as Don Juan of Austria. Yes, he is the Don Juan. And uh, so he realized that um, using, he had six galasses, and he knew that he could blunt the attack of the uh, Turkish fleet under the command of Ali Pasha. And so he basically um, uh, would, uh, uh, you know, he had, he actually massed his troops. He had 10,000 Spanish infantrymen, and they all had muskets, basically, and uh, Erebus, actually. And uh, so he knew that uh, his firepower could overwhelm the enemy rather than 
actually close in action. And this uh, uh, was pretty good. You know, Don Juan told his men, uh, don't fire until you know um, that you will have the blood of the enemy splash you. Wow, you know, uh, I, I don't go into battles like that. But uh, nevertheless, um, the, this, this was the last time you even mentioned, the, um, um, you know, what Don Juan did is he took away those beaks. He said, we don't need them. You know, they slow us down. We have to be able to maneuver and use these heavy ships, the Galvis, to actually, you know, support the smaller galleys so that they then can divide and conquer the enemy. Well, 7 October 1571, they actually did that. However, afterwards, the ram is kind of forgotten. Um, you know, in the age of sail, um, we see, you know, a new type of tactic, uh, you know, actually broadside actions, more cannons. That's what the, this battle, Lepanto, taught us was that like, we can destroy ships from afar and in close action with cannon. Now, believe it or not, um, someone in Korea, an admiral named Ye Sun Sin, uh, developed what are called turtle ships. And a turtle ship is a real great combination because it's called the first ironclad propelled by oars. It had uh, three eighths of an inch armor on top. The armor all has spearheads or knives on top so people can't board, but they're also armed with cannon and they do have a ram. This man was able in the 1590s to defeat four different Japanese invasions of Korea. He's killed in his last battle. But I think what makes it real important that um, Europeans know nothing about it, right? And so actually we call these turtle ships the first um, ironclad because of the shield plating on top of the ship. Well, now we've entered the industrial age. And I have to tell you, uh, during our entrance in the industrial age in the 19th century, meant everything was changed. You know, if you're a sailor uh, in the 17th, 18th century, if you're on board uh, the Royal George, commanded by Sir Edward Hawke during the Battle of Quiberon Bay, guess what? You fought the same way you would have fought 50 years later broadside actions uh, and uh, some boarding, but the big thing is nothing had changed. The industrial age, however, is going to bring everything full circle. Why? Uh, because uh, basically the Europeans are going to introduce new motive power systems and also improved ordnance. As we know, um, this causes a rapid and major change in ship design. And that is all because that we're starting to utilize these new techniques and, uh, uh, and weaponry. So um, I have to say, first thing is the steam engine. That means I can go anywhere I want. Of course, we first use paddle wheels. Those are bad. Why? Because they uh, can be shot uh, and the paddle wheel can be uh, damaged and won't move the vessel properly. And also many of those paddle wheels have what are called a walking beam engine and the, therefore you can shoot that and the ship would be disabled. So a group of people uh, led by Francis Pettit Smith John Erickson invent the, um, what is known as the screw propeller. Uh, this is really tremendous. That means that the engine is hidden, protected um, by the hull underwater. And so you are, your engine system is shot proof. You know, if you have a cannon and you shoot at a galley, all those guys at oars, you know, they can have a problem. Of course, they're firing solid shot. 
one of the big things that is going to change everything is the introduction of the explosive shell. Uh, you know, shell guns were designed to be able uh, to fire these types of weapons or shells. Um, Joseph Henry Paxenhans, Brigadier General, uh, is going to really teach us all in 1825 that, oh, cannon can sink any, shell guns can sink any ship whatsoever. Now, this is a pretty bad uh, circumstance for all these people believing in wooden ships. So what's going to happen is that Paxton Hans, in one of his books, he um, argued that modern ships should be steam-powered, iron-plated, and armed with like-caliber shell guns. And the creation of a safe shell gun, one of those creators is John Dahlgren, um, is going to really prove a difference during the Crimean War. Because on 30 November 1853, shell guns on Russian ships completely destroy a Turkish fleet. Um, and so the French and British navies trying to act in the uh, Black Sea take good note. And what do they do? They create floating iron cased batteries, floating batteries, which they can tow in and it's shell guns cannot damage that iron and so they will capture the forts at Kinburn and so this is sets the stage. The age of iron was born now. So, the Confederates, of course, when the Civil War breaks out, it's a real rush to who's going to find the better technology to be able to defeat the enemy. So the Confederates all of a sudden come across the idea. You see, there's this man known as Charles Ellett. And Charles Ellett Jr. is a brilliant engineer. He actually... Um, was in Europe and witnessed the sinking of um, a, uh, a, 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 a passenger ship uh, by a smaller ship known as the Vespa. Vesta. And it, it happens in 1854. He immediately goes, oh my gosh, I, I've got to um, make a big deal because the Vesta sank this larger ship, the SS Arctic, in a way that caused it to sink immediately. So, Ellet will write a book, Coast and Harbor Defense, or the Substitution of Battering Rams for Ships of War, 1855. Everyone says, ah, go away with that, you know, because at that time when using wooden ships, you can't get close enough to ram. Then the development of ironclads made everyone go back and realize, oh my gosh, we need to have that type of weapon. So really, um, the first ram is going to be um, actually not this vessel. This is the conversion of the Merrimack into the Virginia. But I want you to note uh, the ram is affixed like in um, Roman days, right? Affixed to the hull, all right? Ellet is saying, gosh, you need to strengthen the bow and make the ship the ram itself. However, the Confederates uh, were desperate. They actually produced the first ram of the Civil War, and that is going to be uh, the CSS Manassas. And the Manassas is going to be planned as a blockade runner. It was a terrible ship. Um, I have to say that uh, it had one gun, a 52-pounder, uh, at the bow, and to aim the ship, you aim the gun, you had to turn the ship, but it had this ram. And so on um, 9 October, 
um, basically, or 11 October 1861, the USS or CSS Manassas will come and try to ram the USS Richmond at the head of the passes. Well, when it rams, it actually hits a coal barge and damages itself so much, loses one of its smokestacks, um, and has to move away. The engine wasn't braced well enough. So, but it sent a scare throughout the Union fleet that they left the head of the passes and went down the Delta uh, out to sea. So the idea, the fear, like a bayonet charge of infantry, the ram will prove the day. So wrote Stephen Russell Mallory uh, to uh, Franklin Buchanan, the commander of the CSS Virginia. Now, the man that's uh, really responsible for the overall concept of the Virginia is a man known as John Mercer Brook. And so he will test armor and do all that sort of stuff. That's why uh, the Virginia had two layers of two inch iron plate. He also realizes that it has to be charged armed with a multitude of different armament. So he's got four rifled guns on it, two hot shot guns, and four regular shell guns. This means I'm in death knell for every wooden ship. But what? But what is realized is that the <coughs> Confederacy is low on gunpowder. So Brooke comes up with the idea, well, let's put a ram on us, and all we have to do is run around and ram different ships. You know, yay, we'll win the day because we're shot proof. And that's all uh, I have to tell you is proven on um, what is known as um, March 8, 1862, because the Virginia will come out and actually ram and sink the USS Cumberland. This is a vicious battle because <clears throat> here comes the Virginia, as I said, like a half-submerged crocodile intent on evil, and they will then ram the Cumberland. Cumberland has no way to stop it. Yes, it was at anchor, but this ram broke in through the berth deck of the Cumberland, causing it to rapidly sink. The ram breaks off because of its faulty mounting. And so consequently, uh, we will realize that <clears throat> the uh, uh, Confederates will not be able to use uh, that ram on the Virginia for the rest of the two-day battle known as the Battle of Hampton Roads. And I have to say, you know, when the, when the ram Virginia struck the Cumberland, one person, Robert Dabney Minor, ran down the gun deck shouting, our cleaver has cut us open. Problem is, they can't put the ship in reverse very easily, and so the Virginia almost goes down with his intended victim. The very fear you had when trimarines are attacking you know, Greek ships, attacking Phoenicians, that was a big fear. So uh, we have to have backing ability. So um, when we fight the Battle of March 9, 1862, when you look closely at that battle, you'll realize that the Virginia will try and ram the monitor. Actually, it takes a big run at the monitor. Uh, Captain Worden, John Worden, realizes what is happening. He verves his ironclad, so, but... What happened is Catesby App Roger Jones, then commander of the uh, Virginia, will put the ship in reverse before it strikes the monitor. So it only hits the monitor with a glancing blow. They do not know their ram is missing. So later in the battle, at the great conclusion, Actually, John Worden decides he sees the Virginia floating high in the water. He can see that propeller turning. So he wants to ram the fantail of the Virginia. The big trouble is he has a steering malfunction. And, of course, 
He then gets, uh, the monitor gets hit in the pilot house, and the battle virtually is over. Now, this made the Federals go, oh my gosh, actually the Virginia will get a new ram uh, when it goes back into dry dock after those two days battles. And this ram is 12 feet long, cast iron with a steel tip. And, you know, they have the plans for the monitor, the Confederates do, so they have it so that it will go beneath the armored deck into the boilerplate hull. Boom, uh, that would have sank the monitor, but it never gets a chance to do so. The Federals respond, and they will <clears throat> actually <clears throat> be given the USS Vanderbilt by uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And they reinforce the bow. Its main purpose, because it's a very fast steamer, that if the Virginia comes, or they would call it the Merrimack, comes past um, Fort Monroe, they're going to ram it. Now, so I have to say this is shocking. And, uh, of course, Charles Ellett is a very famous engineer. He built the Wheeling Suspension Bridge. He built Schenectady Canal. Uh, he did all sorts of great things. He's a brilliant mind. And so, as a result of that, he's running around trying to say, hey, look about this ramming stuff. Well, like George McClellan says, get away from me. That won't work. And yet, um, when the ramming of the Cumberland happens, Edwin Stanton gets in touch with Charles Ellett, says, so tell me more about these rams. And he says, it was pretty easy. We get fast paddle wheelers and we reinforce the bow. They're not going to have a real ram at the end of the bow because the bow itself is the weapon. And as a result of that, um, we're going to see, you know, the Vanderbilt's on the same principle. In this case, um, the um, this is Charles Ellett, of course. Ellett uh, is uh, a brilliant engineer. His concepts are pretty good because, you know, he is given money to buy 10 steamers, steamers like the Queen of the West, and uh, that's a ram with one gun. So the object is, just like the Virginia did to the Cumberland, it rammed it and shot into the hull with its forward rifle. This is what the Queen of the West could do. Now, <clears throat> now basically, um, the Ram Fleet, or it's called the United States Ram Fleet, commanded by Colonel Ellett, kind of separate from the Navy, but told to work with the Navy, comes and joins up with the fleet commanded by Flag Officer Charles Henry Davis. And as a result of that, you know, they are trying to move down the Mississippi. <clears throat> by doing so, uh, they're clearing the way. No one can stop the, com the federal ironclads. So what will happen is that basically... Um, Captain James Montgomery um, is going to attack the Union fleet at what is known as the Battle of Plum Bend. The Confederal ironclads just sitting there, and so a bunch of these rams, like the General Price, Sterling Price, General Sumter, General Bragg, uh, with reinforced bows, they also are called cotton clads, Aha, because they think cotton's going to protect them. They actually put some iron around their engine boilers, but the big thing is their purpose is just to ram you. And so they surprise the Union fleet, and as a result of it, um, the Sterling Price and General Sumner sank the ironclad, the USS Cincinnati. That's one of those pook, pook turtles. Um, and then the Earl Van Doren rams and sinks the USS Mound City. This is proving the power of rams because all those Union ships did not have their steam up, so they're stationary. So being a stationary target was perfect for a ram. Now this, now they may have had a good day on 10 May, 
However, the Confederate River Defense Fleet is going to retreat down to Memphis, and there, without a lot of coal, they are attacked by uh, the Union fleet. And um, they destroy um, six of the, the, the Confederate rams. However, the Queen of the West will go ahead of the column and uh, ram um, the uh, one ship, and then actually it will get rammed, and its side wheel is, guess what? <laughs> Broken off. <laughs> And so it's dead in the water. During that action, Charles Ellett will be shot in the knee. And he is the only Union casualty. Because Ironclads versus Rams, who's going to win? The Ironclad, generally speaking, if they have their steam up and so forth. So this uh, was set a stage for uh, Rams. Now the Confederates say, oh my gosh. Uh, we have to have better rams ourselves. And so as a result of that, uh, they will start building new ironclads, such as the CSS Albemarle, that has a built-in ram. In other words, it's part of the structure, the hull of the ship, attached to the keel. So in other words, that's not going to break off. And here on April 19, 18. Uh, 64, the Albemarle will sink the USS Southfield. Actually, when it rams it, it almost goes down with the Southfield. Southfield slips off, and the Albemarle goes and attacks uh, other ships. Now, I have to tell you that the Albemarle, every Confederate ironclad, is going to be equipped with rams from now on. And this is a very important technique for um, the Confederates to use. And so one of the best, now the Albemarle will actually fight the entire Union North Carolina squadron. And so the, those wooden ships decide to ram, in other words, you could take a wooden ship and ram an ironclad. The idea is to push it back so water comes in and it sinks. So, but the trouble is, if you try to come up to an ironclad and you are a wooden ship, what might happen to you? Um, you get shot and damaged. Uh, and so that technique during the June 5th, 1864 Battle of Albemarle Sound fails. Now, I have to tell you that, uh, oops, I don't want to go there yet, um, that this the great, perhaps the, the best Confederate ironclad built during the war is known as the CSS Atlanta. Yes, it has a ram, and that ram um, is should be good, but the Tennessee can only go five knots. So on uh, 5 May 1864, uh, Farragut's fleet comes through the entrance to Mobile Bay. The Tennessee is trying to catch up with it, and it's too slow. The Federal fleet goes by, and it can't ram. Federal fleet anchors at what is called the Anchorage in Mobile Bay, and that will cause Buchanan to attack his enemy, right? Now, what's amazing is that he almost rams straight on the Hartford, just scraping right by the ship. And that, that happened several times. You know, during the Battle of New Orleans, the forts, uh, the Manassas, or that ram, will actually try to aim at the paddle wheel of the USS Mississippi. It misses and scraped along the side, cutting in about four inches. That George Dewey can look down and see all the copper bolts that were affixing the, the hull or the wood uh, to the ship. So the Tennessee will run into serious trouble. It can't ram after it misses the Hartford. Uh, it can't ram any other ships. And so as a result of that, 
Union wooden ships start to ram the Tennessee. Uh, the Lackawanda will try to ram right as the Hartford does. Lackawanda, now these are not ships made for ramming, but they say this is how we're going to get this vessel. And so the Lackawanda runs into the Hartford, cracks the Hartford down to uh, the waterline, right where Farragut is hanging on the shrouds, you know, going, do this, do that. And so, you know, Farragut says, get out of the way. He rams the Tennessee again. There are the Mongahela, the Asapi, and uh, uh, all ram the, the uh, Tennessee. Tennessee is dead in the water. Uh, the ramming does not sink it uh, or damage it well enough. So a monitor with 15-inch shells has to come up and do the bidding. Now, I think... So during the Civil War, what does this all mean? Well, rams are recognized because the ordnance only has so much of a range. And engines are gaining greater speed. So the object is, I can run down an enemy ship faster than they can sink me. Uh, because it takes time to reload a heavy 11-inch Dahlgren, that takes about eight minutes to reload at least. And so that's a vineyard rush. So in other words, I got that time to try and strike the enemy. Well, the great battle that proves it all uh, is true, is the Battle of Lisa. And this takes place in 1866. Um, basically, um, the commander, uh, Rear Admiral Teckenhoff, uh, is going to put his ships in a fletch or an arrow shape with the very intent of ramming. And so they're going to sink uh, the Re d'Italia uh, by the Ferdinand Max, Teckenhoff's flagship. Actually, one of the other wooden ships, the Kaiser, uh, is going to try and ram Italian vessels at well. Uh, Italians were poorly led. But this is the last real ramming battle of history. Now, we know submarines get rammed by destroyers. Uh, there, there are actions like that. But the big thing we have to realize is that the ram goes out of fashion just like it had at Lepanto and battles beforehand because it did not have, uh, it, it was blown up by artillery. Artillery improves after the Civil War. When you finally have guns, even though you see ram-type hulls on many ships built in the 1880s and early 1890s, soon they'll realize well, we can't get there because now we start to have ranges of five miles with our cannon. And that means you don't, I don't care how fast you're going, unless you have very bad artillery. So the ram in history was a dramatic weapon. Seen here in Hampton Roads during the Battle of uh, the Hampton Roads on March 8th, seen in battles like Salamis, Actium. Uh, you know, you just go through the list of ram-based battles, and it is a shocking event on the battlefield which almost makes you stop. And, uh, and, and so the big issue is, though, that the uh, ram is, is based on speed, based on protection of your ship, no protection against five inch or five mile range, 10 inch shells means you're not going to ram anymore. But uh, it is famous just all for you people who are a little my age, perchance, uh, will remember Ben Hur scene. And that is very dramatic. And so the ram was realized as dramatic effect. However, um, it's outdone by ordinance. So anyway, that's my story about ramming speed. Until then, I just wish you all a great huzzah. Yeah, huzzah.